we'll, we'll get set for the second match, Bloody Face versus Monsanto. It's our featured match of the day. Uh, the Paladin being protected from Monsanto, the Priest being protected, but the Mechathun Warlock, the Quest Warlock, is what we're focusing on. Check out this video on this featured matchup as we get ready for the second best of three. Hi, I'm Monsanto. I, I, I was very consistent last year, maybe one of the most consistent players on NA uh, on ladder, but I really have yet to win any big tournament, and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, my name's Brian Eason, also known as Bloodyface. I've played card games my whole life. I'm really good at analyzing things. You know, that in combination with my work ethic, I just play so much Hearthstone, and I play to a point where if I don't feel happy with my lineup, I just continuously keep playing, and it doesn't really matter if I lose sleep or whatever. I'm just really focused on trying to, like, you know, be comfortable with my lineup and feel really good. I'm very lazy, which means I like staying home a lot. And when I'm home, I can play Hearthstone. So I do that, like, a lot. So I get a lot of practice. Monsanto is a really interesting player. I like him as a player because he's very opinionated. And I think he likes to take stances that are kind of going against the grain. I don't really know if I actually have any advantages over him. I actually see a lot of myself in him. I'm extremely opinionated, and I pretty much disagree with everybody all the time. I don't know who's right. I mean, obviously, I think I'm right. What makes me special as a player, I think, is I try everything. I try every possibility in decks. I try new things. And so when there's something that went under the radar, there's a big chance that I actually found it and I can bring that deck. I'm kind of a more creative type person. I'm more of like artsy. And I think that kind of translates to Hearthstone where I think of a lot of a weird ideas. And I try a lot, and, you know, granted, a lot of them are bad and I think I'm definitely one of the best, but at the same time, I realize that there's still room for improvement. I know where my weaknesses are, and I'm just trying to strive every day to be a better version of myself than I was the previous day. Qualifying to Global Finals is really important for me. I'm gonna do my best. I mean, that's what I'm, that's my whole life is Hearthstone right now, so that's what I'm aiming for the most. Monsanto aiming for number one, Bloody Face disagreeing with players. These are the storylines that we see echo throughout season two mm -hmm. as uh, we talk about these two players, Bloody Face and Monsanto, both challenging for number one. Although Monsanto, uh, his, his play has been really good. It's the decks that seem to be one of the big question marks when it comes to Monsanto. Uh, primarily the fact that yesterday he brought the Quest Warlock to UJ and he played on stream and it went really badly. Uh, I think there was a couple of turns where it looked like it was missequenced, and like he started like running into weird hand size issues, and and the usual common problems when you play Quest Warlock is you just you play the quest and then you die, uh, or you, you know. And, and it felt like that was actually happening. And then Monsanto went onto Twitter and said, uh, "I played pretty badly. If I, I I cannot do, I cannot keep this up. Like if I do this." Uh, I am going to be in like big trouble, so I'm going to like improve my play, etc. Just basically apologizing for uh, the poor display. Now, I think uh, going back into it and rewatching a little bit, I think he's a little hard on himself. I think there's maybe one or two turns that he can kind of be very debatable. But the problem is, uh, when you when you play a worse deck in terms of the tier, it just means you have less mistakes you can make. You got to be perfect essentially yeah. when you're playing that kind of right. deck. I feel like that's probably an easy way to define tiers outside of win rates because a lot of times we define tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 purely based off the win percentages that it has. But another way that you could potentially look at it is how powerful the deck is relative to how many mistakes that it can, you can make. How mm. forgiving is this deck? Um, and so it's a lot of times it's like, you know, with, with Drew, it doesn't really matter too much. Just like still win the board with overwhelming pressure, or like Priest. Oh well, it doesn't matter if you sequence things a little bit wrong. Sometimes you can just you have a minion stick anyways, or North Shire cleric on one. You can just still win the game that way. Yeah, um, and we, you know we've seen some of that over the past year in competitive Hearthstone, where the win rates don't reflect at least the pro player sentiment on deck lists. Uh, Topsy Turvy Priest is one of them that comes to mind uh, from the meta from the meta earlier on in the year uh, before we move to the Grand Master system. Holy Wrath Paladin is another big one, where its win rates specifically on ladder are pretty atrocious. One of that it, uh, one reason to that is due to just the nature of the ladder metagame and aggressive decks being more powerful. Uh, Holy Wrath Paladin 
struggles to find a metagame where it can succeed in ladder, but also it's because it's a very difficult deck to play with a lot of resources to manage. Um, I feel like Quest Warlock is that times 10. Uh, Quest Warlock is not just managing hand size and resources. It's all about every turn matters because it's about mana management. And also there's some things that you can do that will just ruin your combo that are very easy to just kind of, uh, you know, glance over, right? If you play Galvanizer before you play Plot Twist, it means that if you shuffle Mechathune back into your deck, it comes into your hand at full cost. You no longer have the, the Plague of Flames, uh, of, of the ability to activate it with Plague of Flames. Like it's small things like that, but a bunch of those things that add up over time that make the deck very difficult to play. Uh, so uh, it is one of my favorite decks. I've been practicing it a lot. I've made a mistake in every game that I've played of it. And I still take wins some time, and I do think that something that Saiyan said in his interview where he wanted his matchups to be more polarized because of the way the metagame is and because you can have a polarized matchup that you keep in your back pocket and you don't have to play it, but if you do, you want it to be targeting something specific. I think that Quest Warlock is actually a good bring. I think that its matchup against Priest is actually really good. Uh, and if you can find a situation where you're getting that matchup, then uh, you're rewarded for, for taking that risk. Okay. Yeah, and I think it kind of is like going back to the conversation that we had. It's all about the give and take of your perspective, right? Do you define Tier 1 as a deck that anybody, your average player, I think the average player is like rank 16 or 17 in Hearthstone, um, and they can pile it at a reasonable ground floor and have an effective win percentage. Is that considered Tier 1? Because then if so, then if you go back to previous matches like Murloc Paladin, Mech Hunter, like, you know, like, like, Murloc Shaman's currently tearing up ladder, you know? Yeah. Those are the decks that people can consider to be, like, a, a good and powerful deck that basically people understand. Or is it Patron Warrior? Is it Razakis Priest, where all the data and all the aggregate win rates across the board is, like, below 50%, which defines as a Tier 3 deck, but in the hands of a good player, it's, like, 70 80% win rate deck. It's, it's hard to say, right? Because it depends on who you're asking. Yeah. So um, it's Don't definitely go. one of those decks where I feel like belongs in that pre, uh, Razakis Priest Patron Warrior territory because it's, like, it's such a complicated deck, and you can easily keep losing with Is it. But injured? perhaps in the hands of Monsanto, or Monsanto when he's playing well. We're going to cross that bridge eventually, or hopefully, because I want to see more of that Warlock. But for now, we're going to go into a matchup that uh, is uh, is pretty much defining this weekend, which is OTK Paladin versus Priest. We've seen this a handful of times so far. And uh, I kind of want to pull up some of the data, so I'll be right back. Okay. Bye, Dan. Yeah, I'll be back in a moment. Bloody face, uh, decent start here with the Priest. Northshire Cleric on turn one, injured Blade Master coined out on turn two to avoid the uh, Hammer of Wrath slash True Super Champion that could punish it coming down on turn three. To be able to heal it out of range. Uh, this matchup, uh, there's some players that are on that are on the fence about it. There's some players that think Holy Wrath Paladin is favored, and there's some players that think that those Holy Let Wrath Paladin think. players are idiots, and that Priest is favored and has no bad matchups. Um, I don't know where I lie on this one uh, because I do understand the arguments from the players that think Holy Wrath Paladin is favored, but in practice, it just feels like Priest runs away with the game too often. Um, but we'll see. I, I know Fiery Bat Let early on in the season think. mentioned that it's all about early timeout usage. Force your opponent to extend further onto the board. Save your removal for, save your removal for later. Um, but again, like we just energy. haven't seen it in Grandmasters to the extent of I can definitively say that Holy Wrath Paladin has a, a decent matchup against Breeze. Well, surprisingly, the, it hasn't actually lined up as much as you think. Holy Wrath Paladins played like Warrior and Druid, even Warlock, a handful of times. Yeah, it's only I think there's only four uh, so games amazing. of this matchup in America's Grandmasters that we've seen. Uh, if I remember correctly, and Priest won three out of the four, um, with Firebat taking the only win. Uh, on the other side of the matchup, I may be mistaken there. I don't have the stats in front of me, but I looked at him earlier. Yeah, a lot of the Holy Wrath Paladin, I guess, doesn't really want to line up into the Priest scenario. But it looks like you're right. It's been mainly Druids, mainly the Warriors. Yeah. With a couple of Shamans thrown in there. Yeah, I mean, Holy Wrath Paladin really picked up in popularity uh, this week. Um, more so than it had in previous weeks. Uh, so we'll probably see more of the matchup uh, moving forward. I mean, we saw it in the last game. 
or in the last Let series. Obviously, Sane had a fantastic opening hand, uh, but he took a win. Uh, now we're seeing it again here, and Monsanto does have a timeout, but after that, he doesn't have much removal, and Bloody Face already piecing together some damage, already has Divine Spirit, Inner Fire in hand with Power Watch Shield. I mean, right now, he could go in with 15 points of damage, uh, and next turn, that's just going to keep going up and up and up. Wow. That's a lot of firepower that you can add right here, right now. But is it worth it? That's the question. Uh, Bloody Face knows Monsanto's going to turn five, which means he could shrink Ray. So you don't want to go too all in on this board. Uh, also, he wants to kind of spread the wealth among these minions uh, to play around a possible subdue coming out from Monsanto. Um, in the light, so yeah. Light Warden plus heal up. Not many resources expended. Still puts another threat on the board. Okay, well, Monsanto's dead if he doesn't time out. Uh, he could Consecration, kill the injured, or kill the Norshire Cleric, and then Elven Archer, the injured Blade Master. Okay. Um, wonder. Uh, it, he wouldn't kill the Cleric if he... Consecration and then uh, no no true silver champion the Northshire cleric and Elven archer the uh, injured blade master just leave it at a four four okay so it goes four to eight to sixteen if they have a circle of healing that you die though I mean that's that's again oh, a four wonder. card combination yeah on turn five unlikely yeah although if um, if Bloody Faces, Injured Blade Masters at 5 health, the same thing. 5, 10 to 20. So it's still safe. Oh, quickly. Let me think. That's true. Because he, uh, by hitting the uh, Northshire Cleric, he can actually go up to 20. Uh, I think it's entirely unreasonable to try and play around a double Divine Spirit Inner Fire this early. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's entirely unreasonable. <laughs> and yet it keeps happening. Womp womp. Game one in the books. Let's move it along, folks. All right, cool. Game one over to Bloody Face. Uh, getting that early first blood. And that OTK Paladin Protect not working out. This is, I believe, what Frozen did yesterday as well with the Ban Paladin, or sorry, Protect Paladin, Ban Druid lineup. And I believe it's the same type of lineup from the other side. Uh, Buddy Face was playing against Frozen. Bloody Face is playing against Monsanto. Both his opponents banned very similarly. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is why I can't buy into the argument that Holy Wrath Paladin is favored. Because Holy Wrath Paladin, its ability to cheese wins is like taking a 1 in 20 on turn 5. Which is kind of how cheese should be. Which is how cheese should be. Whereas Priest's version of cheesing wins is just by having Northshire Cleric on 1 and then hitting a not too unreasonable combo uh, early on in the game. It didn't need to be Divine Spirit, Divine Spirit. Uh, inner fire. It could have been a series of health buffs over a few turns. Sure. And then you have to overreact as Holy Wrath Paladin. A cheese can come over like four turns in many different ways uh, from Priest. So, uh, Dan, that is a tier one deck. That's your answer. Uh, we'll well, how do you break. define a tier one deck? Priest is how you define it. There you go. Uh, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have game two of this best of three. Stay tuned. than they've ever been.
name is Sam Braithwaite, and I'm the Senior Global Franchise Lead for Hearthstone Esports. This event was especially cool because it takes place right after the brand new expansion, Rise of Shadows. Historically in Hearthstone Esports, we do our big events like this towards the end of an expansion cycle, but we really wanted to shake things up and really showcase that not only is the world champion the person who can pilot the best decks, but also the person who, when presented with a brand new game, can put together the best decks leading into the world championship. Cheers to you guys, the sold out crowd here for the HCT 2019 World Championship. Welcome back to 2019 HCE World Championship. We've had a lot of fun games and we're looking forward to the grand finals. Showdown, Viper versus Hunter Ace, only one to be the champion. Oh, come on! Oh, Alex, Alex Grant! Will be dead? Wackle pick a Vince oh, coming out oh, from Hunter Ace! It's now or never, Arch Villa Okay! In a completely solved game, Hunter Ace finds a way to maximize his chances! It's been a wonderful journey throughout the past few years of the Hearthstone Championship Tour, where stars were made and dreams came true. Life Ace currently up 1-0 over Monsanto as we turn to the Holy Wrath versus the Control Warrior. The Holy Wrath Paladin uh, has been getting some wins against the, the Warrior, uh, ones that I feel like I, I've been snuck through. I feel like Warrior has a lot more uh, that they can do against it, but then I look at their deck list and it feels like they're woefully unprepared. A lot of them are uh, sometimes even cutting shield blocks entirely and, and not yep. even having the ability to gain the armor and get outside the range of even the first Holy Wrath, well, than the second one. So, you know, we'll see how this ends up panning out. Uh, can Bloody Face utilize uh, Warrior despite the fact that the Discover pool has changed for a lot of their most important cards? Yeah, it has changed, but I think that in this matchup specifically, uh, it might have changed for the better. Because you're more likely to discover these big uh, neutral minions that have more of an impact in the matchup. The only argument they can make is that you're less likely to discover Vicious Scrapbound, uh, which gives you the burst of armor. Um, but you're more likely to discover Zilliax in both cases, uh, which is uh, can be uh, sometimes a benefit in the Ooh, matchup. That weapons project is valuable, though. Yes, the weapons project, I think, is somewhat of a necessity. Uh, in this uh, matchup nowadays, uh, just because of Zephyrus, there's more damage oh. that can be dealt. Um, Not only does he have Webb's Project, he also has Harrison Jones, two shield blocks, and... Double Eternium Rover, double which is Eternium important. Rover. Yeah. So I think that this is a warrior deck list that can actually do it. I do. Uh, this is a very good one. Um, double web. Oh, my goodness. All right. He got... Two weapons projects. Yeah. A Harrison Jones. Okay. That means no two silvers are going to get through more than once. And even Ashbringer is yeah, not going to get through. is not going to be a factor. So now we see if Monsanto plays the matchup correctly. What's the correct... What's correctly, though? 
armor up every turn. Oh, so you're you're the belief that you should just be hitting up armor up every single time you can. Yes, because I don't think warrior can pressure. So Gallon is wrong. Well, uh, there all you also have to play for tempo as well it, to a certain extent. Right, you have to kind of read how your opponent's playing and play for tempo to an extent because it's useless if you build up an iron total, but let them build up uh, silverhand recruits and small minions that keep chipping off the armor that you're building away. Right, uh, every single point of damage in this paladin deck is going to be directed at your face whenever it can be. Every swing of a weapon, every hammer of wrath, um, it, it's going to be coming face. They're they're, they're going to try and make these annoying boards of 1-1s one and small minions to try and chip off your armor total. Uh, all of those things are going to happen. So you need to play for tempo to a certain extent to make sure you have a board that can uh, keep clearing off these 1-1s one and mm -hmm. keep clearing off these small minions. But after that, then yes, it's about efficient armor gain. It's also about burst of armor and setting yourself up in a position where you're you're doing the math to make sure you can heal for the maximum amount the turn after they play uh, the hammer breath. Also, I like holding on to Dr. Boom for a burst of armor. The turn right before you're about to uh, see them uh, combo, that's when you Dr. Boom because holding on to your actual warrior hero power is more average armor gain over the course of five turns than Dr. Boom is, assuming that, you know, you get the average blast shield amount, which is one out of every five turns. Um, you gain 10 armor over five turns with the warrior hero power, you gain seven armor over five turns on average with Dr. Boom hero power. The light bends to my hill. Every single time a 1-1 one -one attacks, that damage matters, Dan. I believe you. Silverhand recruits. They, they get the job done. They're the unsung hero of Holy Wrath Paladin. Semper Fi. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. now? I'm just trying to fit in, TJ. <laughs> You're a military kid and all. Uh, Once a recruit, always a recruit. Yeah, but my dad was always, uh, he wasn't like a huge like advocate for the military, right? He wasn't like, yeah. everybody should join the military. Fight for your country. Yeah, because you're not in the military. He was, uh, I'm just doing this for the pension. <laughs> <laughs> the benefits, the government benefits. Yeah. Well, thank your dad anyways for serving his country. Yeah. Monsanto has the uh, Snip Snap, the Crab Battle Tank. I like it. I like it separate from the Kaboom Bot, but magnetizing it does make it a little bit harder for Bladeface to deal with without True Silver Champion. Blightface has true silver champion. I don't know. I still like the separate, but equal. <laughs> we don't we don't favor one boom bot or the other. That's right. All mechs are lovely and special. In the eyes of Dr. Boom. Is he going face this weapon? Yes! Every piece of damage goes face. Yeah. Every single one. I Warrior's like not gonna build up a board that's Big enough to where you're gonna win the game all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they build board boards in waves. Right. You answer our Megadillo, then you answer two Morden, then what? Right. Uh, the nice thing too about the weapons project is that over time your weapon actually does chew it out. Yes. But then the Harrison Jones right after. Oof. Yeah, it does get rid of another weapon removal, but it also finds like much needed uh, cards to kind of make its way through this mini game. Uh, but right now, I think that Bloody Face is uh, doing quite well. Uh, he hasn't hit too much card draw, but Christology uh, definitely good. Now he finds the Accolade of Pain, Elven Archer to keep the train going. He needs to find like Prismatic Lens, maybe some second Christology. He's finding it. Is it time for some Harrison Jones? Ah. Uh. To destroy the weapon, draw two cards. I, I mean, it looks good on in theory, right? You develop a 5-4. You destroy your opponent's weapon so they can't remove your what? armor. No. And that two attack with that weapon is armor that you gain for armoring up anyways. Yeah. So it does seem pretty good. And another option is to feign a disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen it work one time. You can't, can't do it in Grandmasters, unfortunately. Yeah. If you... If you disconnect, you lose. 
Um, unfortunate nature of the situation. Monsanto's been having some uh, net issues over the past few weeks. That's why we're not having the Canadian internet, am I right? <laughs> am I right? <laughs> we're so much better in the States where we don't have a yeah. conglomerate of internet companies controlling and price gouging people out of a competitive market. Yeah. yeah. We don't do that. I live in the promised land. Uh, you have Google Fiber. I don't. I had oh. Google Fiber when I lived in Irvine. But, oh, right, right, right. You moved. Um, but I moved, but there's uh, a multitude of independent internet service providers in my area. I'm moving. Uh, that, are, that are very good, great customer service as well, and they're not beholden to the evil ways of giant corporations. Speaking of giant corporations, Monsanto, fortunately, uh, gets ah, back in the game. Well done. Well done, TJ. A trade into a 1-1, one -one, into an elven archer. That's a lot of respect. Yeah, and I think it's pretty correct in this situation. He Monsanto has already fallen behind on armor. Uh, he's at 30, which at this point in the game, you'd want to be at. Let me think. 36, 38 potentially. Yeah. More if you started with the turning rover. <laughs> this Armega Dill looks enticing, Dan. It looks very enticing. But you know what looks even more enticing? The hero power button. The hero power button. So what do you do instead? You play Restless Mummy? That's this mummy hero power. I am a armor up purist when it comes to this matchup. I concede no other ways of play. I am completely blind to every other game plan or play style. I, I don't mind it. Plus, you get to put reasonable pressure on. Yeah, it's it's similar pressure uh, to the uh, Armega Dillo. Yeah. Uh, similar pressure in the immediacy, less pressure over the long term. But I, I like the restless mother. No, 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 oh. Oh. Yes. Dan, it makes me so happy. No, 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 no. My damage isn't trivial either. Yeah. I am, uh, I'm loving it. Hammer. The Hammer of Wrath. Uh, when is he going to hold on to this prismatic? Or how long is he going to hold on to this prismatic? I think it might be one of those situations where he's going to wait to draw it with his holy, draw his holy wrath naturally before. But he already has Shrivala in hand, so I think. Yeah. I think maybe the, the, way, the way to consider it is can you manipulate prismatic lens to let you get holy wrath to a one mana cost? Or in this case, get both Holy Rats under five. Well, you can still do the double combo with a two mana Holy Wrath. Uh, given that your Belfield Bankers don't also get their costs increased. Oh, no, you can't. No, you can't. It has to be one. Yeah, it has to be one. Um, you can do it with the coin, but you're never holding onto the coin for that long. Yeah, because both Belfal Bankers cost two. Yep, and then uh, Holy Wrath would cost two, and then Holy Wrath would cost five. He, yeah, but he can, can still get the other Holy Wrath discounted because he's only played one Prismatic. Ooh, it's pretty hard to turn down. Triple our Mega Dio. Yeah, it's a deviation of game plan slightly, but I think that Monsanto realized that there was Bloody Face did nothing to his board. So he's like, he doesn't well, respect it. He doesn't respect it at all. And so I don't agree with this play, but I do agree let with it. I don't agree with this play because... Let me explain myself, Dan. I know you gave me a weird look there because I contradicted myself in the same sentence. I don't agree with it because, like I said, I'm an armor-up purist. If I see armor-up, I hit it. I operate with two less mana every turn. I'm capped at eight mana every game. Um, but I understand. I get let it. Let me think. I agree. And disagree. <laughs> I was waiting for With it. That assessment. At least you agree. But I don't. But I kind of do. Am I doing it right? You are. Yeah. That's 
fantastic flip-flopping. Well, I, I guess the, the correct way to analyze that is I am and I'm not. Well, one thing that uh, I think you've come to know about me is my favorite way to provide analysis is poorly. Well, poorly and 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 well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and not exactly. See, we're on the same page, but at the same time, we're on a different page. We're on oh, completely no. different pages. Yeah, but I'm glad we're on the same page about that. Well said. Sort of. Six damage going upstairs. I'd like to see Warden play for tempo. As it does generate what actually is a hidden lethal. Because it's uh, 5, 10, 15, 60 on the board, plus the Zilliax, which is a 5 attack minion, plus uh, a, a weapon swing. So that would be enough to cover the 20 life that Bloodyface currently has. Not, It's not likely that Bloodyface is going to let this slide very easily. This looks like a timeout hey, setup to me. Yep. And uh, a very nice timeout setup, because what you want to be doing on the turn you timeout is, one, leaving up a good board state, two, cycling. Uh, it's pretty useless to time out and buy yourself another turn if you're not doing anything on the turn that you're buying yourself another turn. Agreed. This place is scary. One thing that is nice is that uh, Bloody Face is making sure to chip down the armor and not necessarily the life count. The Hammer of Wrath is nice to the face because uh, Monsanto is going to utilize Zilliax eventually. Mm -hmm. I think I can even make an argument that you shouldn't trade in this 1-1 one, one and maybe give Bloodyface an opportunity for you to rush a minion in. The, the thing about that I'm worried about is if Bloodyface, or rather if Monsanto has uh, has to gain life, but Zillia has nothing to attack. I don't think that's going to happen right here because Bloodyface has seven cards in the deck. And if uh, nothing happens, Monsanto could just magnetize onto an existing mech minion like Tomb Warden. Yes. And go face. It is something to just consider in general. Yeah. Monsanto does have to be careful about how he, how greedy he gets with all these oh, armor gain yeah. tools because even though Bloodyface has seven cards left remaining in deck, that can go very quickly. Yeah. Seven cards is, is not a lot, and Monsanto needs multiple turns to set up the amount of armor gain that he wants. A Trinium Rover plus Warpath, uh, wep uh, Weapons Project, the Zilliax onto a minion. Zilliax is often saved for after because you want the maximum amount of life gain that you can get. So oftentimes you're magnetizing a mech with Zilliax to kill the Shavala the turn after they play it for the burst of armor. So Bloody Face, I'm evaluating what spells are left in this deck. He has Christology. Holy Wrath. What Holy now? Wrath. He has a Blood Mage Thanos. A Wild Pyro. A Wild Pyromancer. And a Consecration. Mm -hmm. Does he have a quality? Does not have a quality. I wonder. Wait, does he have a quality in his deck? No, in his hand. And second novice engineer. So, with that knowledge, is there a way from the countdown Holy Wrath so I can guarantee it being less than five? With this Christology draw, there's only a quality in Holy Wrath. Quality, Holy Wrath, Consecration is still in. So his only minion left is Wild Pyro. Wild Pyro. So whatever he draws is going to flip to two. He has a 1-3 to pull out Holy Wrath for two, and then he would have the 50 combo. And that's what he's trying to time. It's actually a little bit likelier that he'd be able to play Novice and flip into it. Oh! oh. Okay, Damn. that's a big deal. That is a big old GG. Wait, so does he just play novice and he wins? Yes. No. Yeah. Why not? Unless he's worried about dying. Oh, right. Quickly. So you play novice in timeout Let and you win. No, 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 because he gains life with the uh, the Zilliax. No, he can't. He can't gain that much. He can't gain that much. You yeah. timeout. You're novice engineer. You win. No, no, does he need to, though? Now he can maybe just play Novice Engineer next turn. Because he can play Novice, Baleful Banker for two, Baleful Banker for two, double Holy Wrath. That's ten mana. He doesn't actually have to play a card. He doesn't have to play anything. Oh, yeah, good point. Really smart by Bloody Face, shutting down Zilliax opportunity, which is so, something that we were talking about. Yeah, and Monsanto realizes there's two cards left. I have to go for the Burst of Armor now. 
Uh, likely a turning rover. Triple Shield slam is a turning rover? I don't know. A turning rover double or a triple warpath? Yeah. Weapons project? Okay. Well, he can... A turning rover bronze gatekeeper? Triple warpath? No, because that's inefficient because then he misses armor up. So you a turning rover... Well, okay, so it's remember gain six life, weapons project gain six life, hero power six life or two life, and even if you're able to maximize all of those, which I don't think you can, you're still below. You're still 50. below fifty. He's gonna try. He's really hoping Bloody Face's last two cards. I'm almost out of cards. Involve Shervala. But we know that uh, it doesn't really matter because the announcer is here. Like That'll do it. I'm out of cards. It's time to test your metal. Yep, just Shervala needs to hits not the board. mess up the combo. Yes. Banker double one. Double Baleful Banker, then double Holy Wrath. I really like the double, like the back to back banker into back to back rats. Yeah. I like that for style points. But way more satisfying. Yep. Well done by Bloody Face. And that's a combo that Monsanto is very hard for him to play around. That's going to do it. Game number two over to Bloody Face. Quick 2 0 as Bloody Face improves his standing. And once again, Plants himself in second place within striking distance, but also firmly in the playoff spot. Yeah. I do like the way that Monsanto played that last turn. He set up a massive minion to be able to combo with Zilliax the next turn, gain the maximum amount of armor by hero powering, leaving his Eternium Rover at one health. So next turn he could have Eternium Rover, Weapons Project, Zilliax, and Armor up. Yeah, he was ready for the Holy Wrath Next turn, Holy Wrath. Yes. So the two turn, Holy Wrath. Zilliax on a six attack minion. It was five attack, would have gained 11 life. Weapons project uh, to 17. Attorney Rover trades in uh, 19. Armor up 21. He was setting up for a 21 burst of armor uh, on the next turn, which would have put him out of range of second Holy Wrath. But alas, there were two in the same turn. Yeah. Really well done. Let's go ahead and check in with Bloody Face. Fresh off his victory. Brian, you there? Hey. Yep. All right, so, uh, you know, pretty solid series overall, 2-0. First game, ah, a little silly, I guess. <laughs> Divine Spirits yeah, and Inner Fire. Pretty broke back. Yeah. Uh, second game, let's talk a little bit about that. That is a deck list that I think a lot of Paladins fear because there's double Weapons Project and a Harrison Jones, uh, as well as the other usual stuff from Warrior. Uh, you know, what, what's in your head going into the matchup, knowing that a player is really prepared for that kind of deck? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's definitely unfavored for Paladin since he's packing double or over and double weapons project. But like, like my hand that game wasn't that strong, but he also didn't have a one drop on one, which allowed me to get a little bit extra tip, chip damage on two. Like, obviously, if I don't get really lucky on the double Holy Wrath uh, cost reduction, then like that game ends up being a lot closer. I think I still come out on top just because I drew my deck so fast. Uh, that last turn, he if he has Zilliax buffed up with our, our Mega Dio, I think he's like out of range of double Holy Wrath, but then I still have like Zephyr's Pyro Blast. And I even had a timeout and a Pyro of Quality left. So I think I could have like somehow like managed to like buy enough time to like deal 60 damage to him. And, and he also has to deal with the Shervalas as well. So yeah. I think like in combination, even if I didn't get the double Holy but yeah, it's just like so fortunate. I'd even play the Novice in the last turn because I want to be extra sneaky. <laughs> I think it's the right but, play. I, I do think that is the right play, the, the novice in there. Because it felt like that's what you were trying to do. You were trying to manipulate Holy Wrath to get the discount so you can uh, get that 50. But um, overall, it still looked like you were in a good spot. We have seen Warriors in the past like clear everything and survive the Holy Wrath, but then they can't deal with like two Shrivalas on board. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Lose. Yeah, got it. Yeah, that's that's why I like Shrival a lot. Because, like, well, I just really like proactive decks because you just get to kind of dictate how the end game goes. And when you throw Zephyrus into the mix, it just balloons into, like, all these different possibilities. And there's no way Warrior... Like, I mean, if, like, Warrior doesn't, like, develop enough onto the board, I could just, like, Zephyrus and the Tyrion, for example, and then start to use a weapons project and a Harrison. So it feels like the Warrior, even though they're favored, they kind of have to play double duty at the end. They have to gain enough armor and also develop and also pressure. So it's just kind of asking a lot for them. Got it, got it. Um, it's been a few weeks of Grand Masters so far, and it feels like 
a lot of times you're tweeting out that you're on the verge of bringing something real spicy, and then uh, you end up kind of playing what is many consider to be a more standardish lineup, and then you go up against someone like Monsanto, who did end up going on that spicy meatball train, bringing Mech, Cthulhu, Warlock, and whatnot. Do you have mm-hmm. any commentary on, like, that specific dynamic that you've been pretty close, but you, it doesn't seem like you've been uh, committing to it versus some people are, are brave enough or silly enough to bring something like that to Grandmasters? Yeah, I mean, there's not a huge opportunity cost to bringing at least one spicy deck since you don't have to win with all your decks. So I think that like a few players have been kind of taking that liberty. Um, I don't really like doing that, though. I kind of like having a more balanced lineup because, you know, you get in these situations where you only have one or two decks. You only need to win with one more deck. And I'd like to be able to pick between my two decks rather than just kind of be pigeonholed into one deck. Um, when I was trying to figure out a spicy lineup, it was really when Priest was on top, and I was trying to figure out, like, how the heck can I just, like, beat Priest? And I tried, like, Mechathune Warlock, even, um, and Highlander Hunter with, like, Mossy Horror techs and stuff. But, like, it just kind of felt like you always had a reactive game plan against Priest, and whenever you're reactive, it's, it's just not a very ideal strategy. And that's kind of what I, like don't like about a lot of the spicy decks, I guess, is that they're a little bit too reactive. I do think Maligos Druid is pretty strong, though. I Like, you, you, you've seen a lot of the big names like Orange, and I think like Fino, Saiyan, Frozen, they all brought Mali Druid in the practice group, and it makes a lot of sense. I think that's like, out of all the spicy decks I've seen, it's definitely my favorite. Got it, got it. Uh, we're out of time for now, given that it's uh, sad we're going to push things along, but congrats on your victory, buddy face, uh, and good luck next week. Thanks. All right, so with that, 